one of my favorite modules on memory hierarchy design. It's from chapter five of Computer Organization and Design Book by Patterson and Hennessy, Appendix B of Hennessy and Patterson, Computer Architecture and Quantitative Approach book. And still some of the slides from my advisor, PhD advisor at UC. All right, so I think it's a good time for us to take a look at the MIPS, the MIPS type of processor chip. So this is something that you can see here. This is QED RM5270. You can click on this link and see more chips. I already did. And this website is showing you different kind of processors that are MIPS based, so MIPS CPUs that are actually used in real life. Right? So if you open the package, so when you get these processors, I mean, some of, how many of you actually uh, saw the CPU on motherboard? Have you actually looked at the motherboard and see a CPU? So it is packaged. If you look at it, it's an IC, usually square-shaped IC, and it can be large or small depending on what kind of processor you have. Uh, but inside the package, if we open the packaging, uh, and by the way, there's an entire research on material science just on packaging. Uh, one of the sponsors of our lab is Juniper, and Juniper is a company that uh, is competing with Cisco on servers. Actually, a lot of servers that we have in the university is called Juniper, and they do packaging, design, processor design, everything. So if you open the package, you're going to see something like this, uh, just the chip itself. Okay. So I'm going to show you one of the cases that actually, this is the one that we had in the slide too, but you can, you can take a look at them and see where they are used, um, and so on. So a lot of the things at the end of the class, when you're reading these descriptions here, you can make sense of a lot of this description. Like we're going to talk about super scalar architecture, pipeline architecture, so like in the, right, in the beginning you see so with their, without pipeline stages, you kind of can make sense of these things um, when you come out of this class. And this is important because no matter what you work on, um, having this information can really help you to develop a program that is optimized as well. So having this knowledge of the computer architecture can be very important. But this is an example of the next processor that you can see. Now let's go back to the slide. I want to show you something else. So this is one example that kind of shows different block diagrams, so it's easier to talk about it. So looking at this chip, you can see that we have some blocks like integer data path. We know what the integer data path is. We have the module 5A, which was focusing on integer ALU, right? Arithmetic and logic unit, that is what it is. We have a pipeline stage, we have ALU, everything that we talked about the processor so far, the ALU that we were talking about was the, prop, was the um, integer ALU. At the end of the last session, we somehow talked about floating point ALU too. I mentioned that the floating point ALU, you already know about the floating point units like adders and multipliers, we talked about it. But we mentioned that in the data path, in the mid processor, you can have floating point ALU. A floating point ALU usually needs more than one clock cycle to finish his task. And that was when we talked about the register renaming, renaming, reordering, and so on, to deal with the stallings that we have to do for the code. Now if you look at the left side, bottom left, you can see that this is the floating point data path. If this is a CPU, we have the integer data path, and then we have floating point data path on the left side, the control signals for each of them. But inside these, Blocks, you can have floating point address, floating point multipliers, and so on. What we want to talk about today and in this module is this part, which is memory. And we want to talk about memory hierarchy. So you can see that the instruction cache, that data cache, these concepts, right? We want to see how these works, what is cache in general, how they work, what are the different policies that we use to manage a cache, and so on. This is a very interesting topic for computer architecture in general, but also for 
any computer scientist or engineer to know about the memory hierarchy because we kind of deal with this. Even if you want to buy a computer, you look at cache and stuff. So sometimes we just know the bigger the better. So it's okay, cache is 32 is good, right? But now you get, a, you get some idea about why it is better and how does it work and so on. So next time that you look at a computer spec, you're gonna have a better vision about it. And you probably don't get information about the pipeline inside the processor when you're buying a computer, but you do get some information about the cache, right? You've heard about the term cache before, right? That's my assumption. And that shows how uh, useful it is to know these topics because it's a very uh, known concept in the computer uh, science and genetic community. Okay, so memory hierarchy, that's what we're gonna call. Now let's go back to the computer abstraction. The very first module, we talked about the computer abstraction and there we talked about this idea of the von Neumann architecture. So von Neumann says we have a processor, we have a memory, we go back and forth between processor and memory, and they thought that this is the way our brain works. We talked about it. It's, it couldn't be farther from how brain actually works, but at the time, they thought that's, a, that's the thing that presents the brain um, you know, behavior, but that's not the case. But it, it led to the design of CPUs and computer architectures, which are actually very uh, important these days. So we have this one Neumann architecture, we have CPU memory, we have an address bus that is a unidirectional bus from CPU to memory, we have data bus, which is bidirectional. Now we have a better idea why it is bidirectional, because we have this load board and store board instructions. So load board will read from memory, store board and store something to the memory. Okay, and now we have control signals too. So at the time when we talked about the control signals, we didn't know what these are, but now we, need, we know that we have memory, memrite, you know, it controls the memory. Okay, if we want to write something from it, if we want to write something to it, read something from it, we see sensing control signals, and these control signals are also coming from CPU to memory. It's the CPU that controls the memory, not the other one. Okay. And for that reason, the control bus is also unidirectional. Okay. So, when do we have memory requests in two cases? We know that for every instruction, we want to read the instruction memory. Okay. I mentioned that the MIPS processor has two different memories. We have instruction memory and the data memory. Do you remember why we had these two memories and not just one? We quickly talked about it last session, last, in last module. But we have a separate instruction memory and a separate data memory. Sir, so do you have an idea? For storing and loading the memory. Yeah, so, so the idea was that we wanted to avoid a type of hazard. Right? Do you remember what it was called? Structural. Structural hazards, right? So you mentioned structural hazards are happen when we have limitations in the processor that they will want to use two resources at the same time and we can't. And we mentioned the MIPS processor, the way they fix this problem is that they have instruction memory and then we have a data memory. Okay. So we avoid structural hazards through having these two different types of memories. So we access memory when we want to read instructions. The address of those instructions is stored in program counter, PC. Okay. And the other case that we read or write to the memory is for data, or handling data. We have a data memory, and the address for the data memory is offset plus base, right? So when we talked about the address loss, we didn't know what we actually put on the address loss, but now we know it. When we have a load board instruction, it has offset and base, we do add offset and base, and the result of the ALU is gonna be placed on the address loss, okay? So that's where we put this. Uh, when we were talking about the pipelining, we just said we send the data to memory, right? But it's more complicated and we're gonna see the complication today. So address is calculated in CPU within ALU through an addition, you put the address on the address bus, and depending on uh, whether we are doing a load word, store word, we read data from or we write data to, uh, the memory through the data bus. Okay. 
So how does it work? CPU calculates the address, send it through the address process <coughs> register. It sets the control signals as well. We're gonna have read and write label, and then the memory sends the data back to CPU in case of the blow board. Now through the data bus. Okay. Now when we were talking about the memory in the last module, we just said, okay, we go to the memory and bring something back. The reality is that there is an entire memory hierarchy there. So every time we have a load board instruction or store board instruction, we leverage that memory hierarchy. Okay, so what is the memory hierarchy about? You can see that we have registers inside the CPU. So at the time I told you that these guys are also memory, but there's a different technology that we use with them. The technology that we use for registers was for flip-flops, right? I mentioned it a few times. Then we had the cache, which is the next layer, which is a little bit farther from the CPU and where the computation happens, and right, which is part of the memory hierarchy. Then we have the main memory, which is usually a DRAM technology. We have the secondary memory, which can be the disks, SSD, storage devices. And then we have a tertiary memory, which is removable, flash, DVD, maybe cloud. So these are um, the tertiary memory that we have here. Something that you want to know about them is that the speed increase when we go from the last layer to the first layer. So the closer it is to the processor, the faster the memory is. And when we say that it's faster, the actual technology that is used in the memory is faster. Okay, so flip-flop uses a bunch of transistors. It's very fast, but it's very expensive too. Okay, actually if you look at the other side, it's the capacity too. So it's very fast, it's very expensive. So we don't want to have a lot of them in the memory. So how many registers do we have in MIPS? By now we know it. How many registers do we have? We have 32 for integer and 32 for floating point, right? So we have 62 registers for that. And that's why we sell less than 0.1 kilobytes of information, right? We don't really have that many uh, registers in the CPU, right? Because they're expensive, but they're very fast. When it goes to cache, we usually use a technology that's called static random access memory, SRAM. SRAM involves six transistors, okay? So it's cheaper than flip-flop, because flip-flop needs 15 transistors uh, or so, uh, but SRAM needs six transistors, but it's, it's actually fast. Not as fast as you know, flip-flops, but it's, it's a pretty fast memory, okay? So now, Part of my lab, we work on alternative technology. These are these these technologies. All they all work with electrons, based on the movement of the electrons. We also do research on a new type of technology that is not in the memory hierarchy now because it's very novel. Uh, it's called magnetic RAM, or they use spintronic devices. So a lot of these technologies, when you work transistors, they work based on the movement of the electrons. So if there is a path for electron to go from one side to another side, we say it's on. And if there's no path, we can say it's off. Okay, so literally electrons move from one side to another side. So we work on a technology that's based on the direction of the spin of the electrons. It's called spectronic. Okay? So that can potentially sit in the cache too. There are many papers on these alternative technologies. So what I'm saying is that the research on the memory hierarchy is not stopped. You know, we are working on alternative technologies. These days, there are companies like Everspin, Global Foundries. Global Foundries used to be the founder for IBM. Uh, these companies are working on these new types of technology to be used in the memory hierarchy. Okay. Okay. So cache usually used when I say SRAM. SRAM technology is for the, for this course. We don't want to go to advanced topics. But a lot of computers that you use right now, your cell phones, when they use cache, they use SRAM technology. So SRAM technology speed is around one to 10 nanoseconds. These are very rough numbers, right? Going from one company to another company, the speed can change, right? TSMC has some speed, Intel has itself, like different companies that have different technologies, 
it depends on the size of the transistor that you use and so on, but the relative number is more important than the actual absolute number. We don't really care about one to 10 nanoseconds. What we wanna see is that it's probably 10 times faster than, like flip flops are almost 10 times faster than SRAM, for example. Then we have the main memory that used dynamic random access memory. It's a different technology. It's cheaper, it's smaller. We can have a lot of them. And if you see on the right side, the capacity gets bigger and bigger too. So for cache, we're talking about tens of megabytes. When we get to the main memory, we're talking about tens of gigabytes. Then we have the secondary memory, which is SSD disk and everything we have. We're talking about terabytes. And then it's theoretically infinite, right? You can have as many flash drives as you want to buy, right? You can just have, have them. Now we talk about cloud. Cloud is actually physically somewhere. As computer scientists and engineers may know that, it's not like really a cloud. It's just a factory in Nevada, okay, that, that saves your data, okay? But it sounds like it's infinite, right? It sounds like we can just we keep buying more and more and we can store things. Okay, so it sounds super big, but it's very slow, right? You don't want to write a program that you can actually try and see how awful it is. You can, you can you know, store some of your data in Flash and force your program to read from Flash. It's going to take forever to finish that program. If you want to directly use cloud, it's not really suggested. Okay? You have to create a mechanism that you move data from cloud to a local computer that they run the program. Otherwise, it's not going to be as fast. Or you want to have your computing system in the cloud, too. That's what Google does, right? You have your CPU in the cloud as well. So your computer is working as an I.O. You send the input, their CPU and memory hierarchy in the cloud. They do the computation for you and they bring it back. Okay. But you can test your program, run your CPU on your computer and data on the, in the cloud, and it's going to take forever to finish a very simple program. So it's slower. It's significantly slower, but the capacities, from our point of view, from the user point of view, is infinite. Right? Depends on how much money you want to spend on it. Okay? So, the patterns we want to see is that going from one level to another level, we get sometime an order of magnitude improvement in speed, rough numbers, right? To just get some ideas and add accurate numbers. And you kind of get three orders of magnitude increase in the capacity when you go from one layer to another layer. When you go from disk, main memory to secondary memory or disk, you get something around three orders of magnitude, a thousand times increase in the capacity. Okay? So that's basically what memory hierarchy is. Have different types of technologies. Placement is important. They're physically placed closer to CPU. Okay? And the bigger it gets, less expensive it is, the slower it's gonna be. Okay. So that's memory hierarchy. Uh, what's the memory hierarchy goal? What are we trying to achieve with creating this memory hierarchy? So looking at what we had in the previous slide, we are working with, there's a trade-off here. We are working with opposite properties. Capacity versus speed. So larger memories are slow, fast memories are small. Okay. So with memory hierarchy design, we want to give the illusion, and this is important, this is not, reality is not the case. We want to give the illusion of having a memory that is large, that is not expensive, and it's pretty fast. Who wants to have this illusion? The user. Right? The user thinks that, okay, this is, this is not only I have a lot of memory, as programmers, I'm not sure how many of you actually work on a program, raise your hand if you did, that you were concerned about the memory. When you were, you did, what was that? Well, it was for the um, it was for the operating systems course. So they made the assignment particularly in a way where you had to worry about that. It would cause an overflow if you hadn't done it right. Okay. But it was okay. it wasn't super in depth. Okay. So I can tell you a project that we're working on right now in the lab, and as we are using we are implementing large transformer models, natural language processing models on very small devices, edge AI accelerators. Our embedded system, their boards are very small. They have limited memory. And, and 
we're trying to deploy that workload, which is such a large workload. Okay, if if you guys like podcasts, what listen to the most recent podcast, like interview of Lex Friedman, and they talk about with the guy who uh, was the, uh, a Tesla AI director, and and they talk about transformers, right? These language models. So when you want to deploy them on these types of architectures, you're gonna have memory limitation, right? And then this entire memory hierarchy, how you deploy the workload, that becomes really important. I have computer scientists in my lab that would never thought that they actually have to think about this, but they have to yeah, because of the limitations that we have. So when you want to really push it to the big models, like for example, machine learning, which is like research, and when you have small devices, then you kind of see that issue. So we want to have this illusion. So why I say, why, why did I ask it? I wanted to see that you guys think that there is an infinite amount of memory when you're working on your program, right? And that means that the memory hierarchy was successful. They achieved the goal of giving the user the illusion of having unlimited memory when you're working with your program, okay? So how do you achieve this goal? One is through hierarchy, as we talked about. So we have the data at the fastest levels. What does hierarchy do? We have the data at the fastest level as a subset of the data at the slower levels. Okay? So we have an entire space, entire data that we have, but we create a hierarchy and we bring part of that, a subset of that, to a memory that is faster and it is in the higher levels of memory hierarchy. So, and also we can do parallelism. Okay, we can have 32 bits and four, we have data bars, then we go from, we don't want to move data from cache and register, we use four bytes, but then we want to use, for example, go from main memory to cache, we move an entire block. Right, parallelism and uh, data transfer. Okay. So, ideally we want to have a hardware that has an average access time close to registers. So every time we call the memory, it's as fast as having it, having it in the register already. And we wanted the average cost to be close to the secondary storage. Secondary storage was disk and everything. So we want to have the cost per bit close to the disk, but that's pretty cheap if you look at how much you spent on an SSD card and how much, you, how much space you get, each bit is going to be very cheap, right? But it's not the case for registers, it's going to be pretty expensive. So that's the goal. Now, let's look at the memory hierarchy from this point of view now. So memory hierarchy, hierarchy use principle of locality. This is actually very important. And there are different types of locality. Um, and it gives us the illusion that that's the cheapest technology per bit at the speed offered by the fastest technology. So looking at the memory hierarchy, this is just one example. We have register file, then we have the caches, we have instruction, layer one instruction cache, and layer one data cache, okay? Separated because we want to avoid the structural hazards. Then we have the second level cache, and we have the main memory and the SSD and so on, disk and so on. So if you look at this hierarchy, part of this hierarchy is within the same chip as CPU. So when you have a processor, part of this memory is inside the same chip. So look at the, looking at the MIPS example, when I opened the package and showed you what it is in the chip, you could see that it's not just the data path, it's not just floating point data path and integer data path. Part of this memory hierarchy is actually placed within the same chip. So you don't actually have, you don't need to go outside the chip to get access to the memory. So can you guess what part of it, if you look at this memory hierarchy, what part of this memory hierarchy is actually within the same processor chip? Christopher, just to make a guess. You can't be wrong, go ahead. Oh, you're talking to me? Yep. 
they're registered to file with cash. Register to file with cash. That's right. Okay. Register to file with <coughs> cash is actually inside the processor chip. Register file is actually within the data path. So this is like really close to the ALE, but these guys are in the same chip. It's not inside the data path. It's in the same on the same chip. Okay. So that's a, that's a bigger biggest difference between the cache and main memory. Main memory is on the same motherboard, right? We have motherboard, we have main memory, and we have the cache inside the chip. Okay. So now, looking at the cost, I just the file has the highest cost per bit, and then we have caches and so on. So the further we get, the cheaper it gets. If you want to look at the speed. These are not accurate numbers, but register file, we can read the data in one clock cycles with the, with the first level cache. We need something around five cycles, not accurate at all. Like it can be two, it can be seven, right? Average. Something around five, then we can get something around 10 clock cycles for the second level cache. And if we had a third level cache, a lot of designs have a third level cache too, especially in modern processors. Gonna be something between 10 to 50, and then we have the main memory which needs 50 clock cycles, and then we have the lowest which is something like SSD. It needs thousands of clock cycles <coughs> to bring data all the way to the processor. Okay, so these are the topics that we're gonna talk about in this module. We're gonna calculate how many clock cycles it takes to bring the data from memory cache to the CPU or from the main memory to the CPU and so on. So, why does memory hierarchy work? Okay, this is this concept is telling us. Okay, let me bring a subset of the entire data to a memory that is closer to the CPU. By itself, it's not intuitive. You know, why should it work? Because how do you even know that you're gonna use that data again? It's just, you just add an overhead to the system. You could go to the main memory and bring bring it to the register. Now you go to the main memory and bring it to the cache. And you're hoping, so this is the thing, the keyword is the hope that we have. they are hoping that we're gonna reuse that data again. So the first time that you bring it, it's gonna be worse than just going to the main memory. The second time you wanna use it, then you don't have to go to the main memory because you have already brought the data to the cache. Okay, so that's the hope. Worst case scenario, if you have to keep going to the main memory, if you have to jump around, you're just adding overheads. We're just adding one extra step of bringing data from main memory to cache and then from cache to the CPU. Okay, but this works because of what we call the 90 10 rule. So 90% of the time spent in the code is actually spent on the 10% of the code. That's the whole idea of loop, right? You can create a very large program. If you look at this, you know, static instruction count, you might have 1,000 lines of code, right? But if you actually look at the dynamic instruction count, you can see that most of the dynamic instruction count is uh, for where we have a loop, for example. A loop can be five lines of code, right? It can be 10 lines of code out of 1,000 lines that you have. But most of the computation is happening there, right? That's a 90-10 rule. And because of that, we can extend it to the memory accesses. We can say 90% of the memory accesses is actually for the 10% of the variables in the program. Okay. So 90% of the memory accesses is for 10% of variables in the program. That is what, help, what is helping us to use this memory hierarchy because the memory access is, on, it, memory access is not uniformly distributed across the code. And for that reason, what we can do, we can store the temperature that is commonly used in a faster memory that is placed closer to CPU. In case of cache, it's actually within the same chip. And you can keep the 90% of the data that is not commonly used in the main memory. Okay? That's why memory hierarchy works. That's why we, uh, the hope that we have that we're gonna use this data more often is an actual reasonable hope, right? When you bring it here, 
to the main to the cache, you're going to use it more often. Okay. So, if we use memory hierarchy in general, we're going to get a system that has the fastest, faster access time, on average. For the first case, it's not as good, but the more you use that data, the better it gets. And it still has a low cost per bit because you're still keeping 90% of the data on the cheaper memory. Okay. So, the important property that we use in the cache hierarchy, as we mentioned, is locality. Okay. Locality is the key. It's why the memory hierarchy works. So now let's look at some examples of locality. So we have two types of locality. We have temporal locality, which is the first one you see here. So temporal locality says the reference memory address that is either used for load or store instruction tends to be referenced again. Okay. So let's see a code. This is a simple MIPS code that is supposed to find the maximum. You have an array, you want to find the maximum number in that array. Okay. So what we do, we compare two registers T1 and T2. If T1 is less, less than or equal to T2, it's not a new maximum, and we just jump to the part of the code that is loading the next data for the comparison. But if it's not less than or equal to T2, it means that it's greater than T2. So if T1 is the new maximum, right? It's a very simple code. So if this condition is not met, we go to the next line. T1, which is the new maximum, is going to be stored in a place in memory that is addressed by S0 plus C. Okay, so that's stored. So in this code, you keep addressing this block, this block in the memory. So you keep writing to address S0 plus 0. Right? So the idea that we have here is that, you know what? When you store it, in the, you want to store it back to the memory. Don't store it back to the memory, main memory. Store it in the cache because most probably later in time, we're going to change it again. Okay? So most probably this is going to remain in the cache. And when this loop is completely over, then you can move the data to main memory if you want to, right? So this is the entire about the temporal locality. One place that we access, we tend to access that place again in that loop. You would be surprised how many of the programs that we write have that feature. And that's why memory hierarchy actually works. It's to find the maximum or minimum, but we keep doing it. Right, we keep doing it for different programs within the temporal locality. Okay, so this is the idea of the temporal locality. The second type of locality is spatial locality. Okay, spatial locality is telling me that if the memory address X is referenced, then other nearby memory addresses tend to be referenced soon. Okay. So if you go to address X in the array, you most probably is gonna you're gonna access the data around it too. Okay, we have an example here, but you work on a project, right? Let's talk about your project, project one. You wanna do vector multiplication. What do you do in vector multiplication? You read the first element from memory, and then you go to the next one, and then you go to the next one, and then you go to the next one, right? That was just a basic example, which we don't, we don't have it here. That is the definition of a spatial locality. These are uh, these arrays are stored in memory. So when you go there, you know that most probably I'm going to need the data after that too, or before that too. Okay. So now what do you do? What you do is very simple. Every time that you go to the main memory, instead of just bringing that data that I'm addressing, bring a chunk of data, bring a block, the data around it as well to the cache. So now next time that you want to read the next value, you don't have to go to the main memory, you have already brought it to the cache. 
but it's already in the faster, closer memory. So every time you access a data from main memory, you just don't go and bring that one. You just bring the entire block. Okay, spatial locality. Does that make sense? Temporal locality, spatial locality. For these two reasons that happen frequently in our programs, no matter what kind of program you're creating, it happens frequently in your program. That's why cache works. If it wasn't happening, then we were adding extra overhead to the system and we couldn't use it. The fact that we have cache in every computer system that you're using today, it means that spatial locality and temporal locality are valid principles. Otherwise, it wouldn't make sense to use cache. But what does cache do? What's the role of cache here? Based on definition, cache is used for hiding look at the definition of the cache in the dictionary. The so cache is used for hiding the recently used data for faster reference. Okay, that's where the term cache is coming from, from kind of hiding the data. Okay, so we can extend the hierarchy levels. You know, we can have third level cache, for example, here as well. The usual practice is that the first level cache capacity is gonna be smaller than the second level cache and smaller than the third level cache, right? So the more, it's, it's just a common thing that we have in the memory archive. The further we get from the method processor, the bigger the capacity of that memory becomes. Okay? So cache is used for this, how does it work? So then we want to read the board from main memory. So this, let's say this is the CPU chip. This is the processor and have a cache here. We want to read a data. If it's already in cache, good. You just go here, this is one board. This you know, red square that you can see here is just one board. So if you want to bring one board, we're lucky that one board is already in the cache, so we just move it to the processor and we're good. But now if it's not in the cache, we have to go to the main memory and find this board. When we find the board, we just don't bring that board to the cache. We bring the entire block around that board to the cache line. So we move a block from main memory to a line in the cache. So these are the terms that you, I keep using in this module, and we're going to get more familiar with it in this module. So we have a cache line, and we have a main memory block. Usually, not usually, always. A line size and block size are equal. Okay, because we want to move a block from main memory to a line for the cache every time that we have a cache miss. Okay? That's how it works. But you can extend it to different layers too. So if you just have one layer of cache and main memory, this is how it works. But if you have a first layer of cache and then the second layer, we do the same thing. We don't jump to the main memory. If it's not in the first layer, we check the second layer. If it's not in the second layer, we check the third layer. If it's in the third layer, then we bring one line of the third layer to one line of the second layer to the one line of the third layer, first layer, okay? So the further we have to go, go, the higher the cost of this miss is gonna be because we have to go through every layer to find it. And it still, it makes sense to do it, right? It's better than just having it for you. Okay, so if I wanna look at the flow chart, it's kinda like this, we have, we receive the read address from CPU. Is it in the cache? If yes, it's pretty fast, very good. We have the data, we're done, we fetch, we move the data from cache and move it to the registers, we're good. If it's not there, we access the main memory and then we move it to the cache. And from the cache, we move it to CPU. You okay. have to have this in mind that we don't go from directly from, if there is a cache miss, we don't go from the main memory directly to the CPU. We always have to go through the memory hierarchy. Main memory, third level cache, second level cache, first level cache, then a CPU, okay? So we do have tags. We're gonna talk about these tags, lines, in the next session. But that's how we identify a block of main memory. And we also use the same tag to see whether that block is inside the cache or not. Yeah. 
So now let's define some terms here. I, I used one of them, but uh, I'm going to define it again. We have the hit rate. We're going to hear about this more. Hit rate is the portion of memory accesses found in the cache. So the cache hit rate is, that, for example, if we have a cache hit rate of 90%, it means 90% of the times that we want to need, we want to, we want to data, it's going to be in the cache. Only 10% of the time, it's not going to be in that cache, and we have to go to the next layer of the cache. Okay. Hit time is how much time it takes to access data that is already in the cache. Okay. If the data is already in the cache, how much time it takes to access that. That time is equal, equal to the time that it takes to find whether it's in the cache or not, plus the time that it actually takes to access data and move it to the processor. Um, this can also be valid for any levels of the cache. So we talked about the hit rate and main memory. Uh, the hit rate in the second layer of the cache is exactly the same definition. How long it takes, like I said, hit rate of 95% in the second level cache. It says that 95% of the data that we want to access to is in the second level cache, which makes the hit rate of 95%. So we have the miss rate, obviously. So the miss rate is the fraction of memory accesses that are not found in that level of memory hierarchy. One minus hit rate. Okay. So miss penalty is the time that it takes to bring that data that is not in the cache to the CPU. So this is the equivalent of checking whether it's in the cache or not. It's going to take some time to find whether it's in the cache or not. But in the miss case, we know that it's not. So it, then we add this time to the time that it takes to transfer the block from memory to the cache. Okay, every time that there's a miss, we have to bring from memory to cache, plus the time that it takes to actually send the data from cache to CPU. Okay, so this is miss penalty. The, Usually the hit time is significantly smaller than miss penalty. Right? If it's not, there's a problem with the technology. Right? Okay, so I'm gonna stop here.